Okay, Anthony, we've, I've already mentioned that, you know, it must be one of the most stressful businesses that you've decided to take on your professional gambling and bookmaking now as well. How do you do unwind from it ever? Can you sort of have a switch off where you can just... Yeah, I don't know. Like, you know, when you talk about like problem gamblers and it's all encompassing for problem gamblers, I think there's... <laughs> like obviously I definitely don't want no sympathy but like I think there's like a problem winner as well like it's kind of it's full on like like it takes up a lot of your stick time for that. <laughs> I know yeah like but do you know what? like I mean just like the amount of time you spend thinking about it and it's like you'd be wanting to switch your brain off a lot of the time and I'm like when you've got no money you're trying to win money and then when you've got a few quid I think I get frustrated if I miss things so like I'm trying to be on top of everything and it can be quite mentally taxing. Um, I try and unwind, like I've got a family, so like now, so like uh, I take the boy to crash every morning, try and, I basically try and free up as much time as I can to spend with my kids, basically. Um, I think that's the best thing you can give your kids is your time. Um, and t- like time's precious enough as it is. And uh, yeah, I'd be just trying, that's the way I try and unwind, to be honest with you. I always want to be around my family, I suppose. Um, just because it's great fun, isn't it? When your kids are younger, running around, and you you half teaching them certain things, and they when they remember certain things, and it's just real nice, basically. And that's how I unwind, basically. Okay, and I was intrigued because when we organised this call, you said you were doing a bit of volunteering, and then you would be able to come on after that. So, can you really tell us a bit about this volunteering? Yeah, it's it's quite an important thing to me, to be honest. Like, um, I always wanted to do some kind of volunteering. Like, I always had it in my head that I was going to, like, give out food at a soup kitchen or something like that, just, to, just as a helping out sort of thing. But, like, when I left my job and I was like, right, I definitely got free time. I can definitely make use of a couple of hours every week. So there's a charity in Dublin called Alone, and it kind of appeals to me because... Both my grandparents on my mum's side died when I was real young and my granddad died when I was young. So I only had my nan basically um, on my dad's side and she's been like on her own. She's 88. She's been on her own. She lives in the house on her own. And like sometimes when you go back and she's so delighted to see you and like just being around somebody who's on their own a lot can like make a big difference. So like alone is just like older people that are it's the one thing I hear to be honest with you is like people who are on their own. Like it really actually like gets to me a little bit and um so yeah just basically i go to a guy and he'd um he basically had he's got quite a few issues with his health and his mental health and stuff like that and he'd had like four or five people that had been to see him for like two or three weeks and then kind of jacked it in and so he'd had all these volunteers going to him and then because he was such a hard case they were jacking it in so i turn up green as grass and it's like you've been paired with this guy and i didn't even they didn't even tell me all this so I rock up at his house and I'm, you know, you like, you meet someone for the first time and you're like, you expect to, to have like the wall stories chats, but it was like a little bit more complicated and a little bit more different. Um, yeah. And I've just, uh, I've just been to see him for like two and a half, three years, basically. And I used to go once a week and just in lockdown, I was going down twice a week to him. Um, and he has it pretty tough, basically. And uh, yeah, just, I, I, I'll actually keep going seeing him, to be honest with you. I think he's like part of, I couldn't, bin him off basically because you're helping him out and you're having a having a quite an effect on his life so i quite like i quite like being able to do that basically is it, is it like your um your barney curly giving a little back <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah no it's just it's, it's it's i suppose originally it was for half selfish reasons as well you want to help someone out and you want to feel good about it and stuff but like just the way it's ended up like we we just go for coffee basically we just walk into walk into a little town center a little village center and go for a coffee and walk back and that's literally all it is but yeah i think it makes a massive difference to his life and it's kind of like there'll be some weeks you'd be going and you're just like i've got loads to do and bloody need to do this need to do that but like you make that little bit of time for somebody else and yeah i suppose it's like you're helping them out a little bit and it's i think when you're a gambler and you're a professional gambler and you start acquiring money um you don't really contribute much apart from spending money on fucking you know whatever holidays and bits and pieces and how much do you even contribute to society in in different ways and sure that was my just little thing to do so just to help someone else out basically no then that, that you, that's all very commendable but you've also helped out uk race courses in their with their gambling products <laughs> now it wasn't you that recommended having fake bookies all around the paddock and stuff like that was it 
what was this now? Fake buckets. Tell me about this. Well, well, some of the, some of the, co- some of the courses, it. some of the courses have got what look like bookmakers. They've they've requisitioned the prime pitches and they're standing up looking like bookmakers, but basically they're just a tote outlet. Oh, okay. was that was no. it? That wasn't your advice. No, no, no. I'd always be. I think if you're standing like horse racing is hard enough to win money on just the earlier the prices are going up and how how good the prices are and how much information you don't have in the market when you set your prices. It's hard to get bets on on horse racing. I think it's hard for yards to keep the mouth shut, but I think what I'm trying to get at is by the time the show comes along, there's certain yards who can keep stuff quiet to the show, and that's what we used to try and do. But the majority of people have talked already, or they've spoken, and you know quite a lot of information by the time 20 minutes to the off comes along. And I think you should probably... I'm not into talking talking bets just in general, basically. So I think if you're laying short prices, you, you might get caught with the odd one, but you should be laying short prices. I'm not into this. These lads that press the green up button on the off and take the 100 quid and they're happy to take 300 quid home at the end of the day, I can't be asked with that. I'd just, I'd rather... I just wouldn't be into that at all. I like it's my version of gambling, the variance of the laying the bets, I suppose. So like you don't know whether you're gonna win a grand on a race or lose a grand on a race. It's a bit more makes it interesting. If you go in there just to green up to win 60 quid, wouldn't wouldn't interest me. You've got to lay bets and see what happens, basically. But, but what have what have you actually advised the UK race courses though? Uh, <laughs> so that was Torster. And I was looking, I was chatting to Torster with I know Ben has a, had a relationship with Torsto. I would have spoke to Mick Livesey a little bit and just from the ground days, from back in the day. So Mick would have known about me. I think Kevin Ackerman, so I met Kevin a couple of times. Um, yeah, and just the, the lads at Torsto were trying to do a few things differently with, you know, when they were putting on like different races and they were like trying to do like three dog races and they were eight dog races and eight dog races wasn't my idea, by the way. But like um, there were certain things they were trying to do and uh, I was just trying to advise them. I think there was one point when I met Lord Hesketh very br- briefly, and he was telling me how excited he was about the three dog races. And like, it was a real good three dog race they had on at Torster one night when I was there. Uh, and you kind of like, you don't want to piss on chips or anything, but like, I was just like, this is, no one's going to be interested in this. Like they'll bet on, they'll bet on six A9 dogs as much as they'll bet on three good quality open race dogs and like, I loved what they were trying to do there, but I think some of it was a little bit naive. And I was just trying to like give them a bookmaking point of view as how to make it more appealable to bookmakers without losing the integrity of what they were trying to do with the open racing and stuff. So bits and pieces like that. Okay, now talking bookmaking, that leads nicely on to AK bets. Now you've just invested in pitches in Ireland, and I've read also that hopefully in the UK as well at some point, just when the clever money says that the racecourse business is on its ass. <laughs> yeah. It's all about price, isn't it, Simon? Like, if the clever money is disappearing, when does it stop? When does it stop being on its arse? And I, I'm always amazed by on-course bookmakers. To be honest, with you. I think they all hark back to 30 years ago. I don't know. I don't. I don't mean to offend anyone, but like, like when they could really make a proper few quid, and they all live in the country house and everything. It's just kind of not what it is now. Um, they all say it's on their arse, but from what I can see, they all turn up every day as well. So, like, how much on its arse is it? Is what I always think. Um, like I'm not going to get rich here. It's just a, it's just another. I'm trying to make another little income stream that I can. I'm actually trying to get involved with a couple of members of my family who, who might not like the jobs and just try and teach them it and it gives them a day out and it sure allows them to just do stuff basic and uh, yeah. And I'm going to do bits and pieces in in Ireland and looking at trying to. I nearly got Galway done there the other day, so I'm just I'm I'm picking up pitches at just the more festivaly meetings and trying to get good pitches basically trying to get a couple of number one pitches and i'm just trying to go as just trying to have a go at it basically just as another income stream that can just tick away in the background after a little while and uh and half run itself and just get good people to help me out with it kind of kind of what mr mr keith has probably done a little bit as well just trying to get stuff working and then move on to the next thing and uh yeah just trying to yeah, just trying to make a few quid and just trying to help some other people out in the in the family as well. Now you had a, you had a nice bit of publicity where I spotted you actually in the Racing Post a couple of weeks ago, uh, where you sort of said that you wanted to help hunters that can't get on get on. So is this is this going to be about getting your card marked and then getting your network into gear? Is that what the the main crux of business is? Yeah, I think um, I think there's information. 
on the race course that's not in the market or not in a bet for SP. Um, like I think all the firms, the previous are the Paddy Pair and the, and the Hills and the Labrooks, and I think they all had the presences on course for a reason. And that was because there was probably what, they, A, to shorten horses up and B, because there was probably information that wasn't being captured in the head offices. I think that is one part of it. From what I've learned in my early days, it's probably not as big a part of it. But I think there is information there if you know what you're looking at. So that is that is one positive. But I think it's just the lay. I actually quite like it as well. I just, I just like dealing with normal people that aren't mad into the betting and just want to have a good time as well. So it's kind of just it's somewhat a little bit different for me as well at the moment. Um, just getting outside a little bit more as well. <laughs> like it's uh, it's nice when you're stuck in front of a computer all day. It's uh, it's just nice to get out as well. So you know. I've read that you um you've helped create models for both poachers and gamekeepers. So I'm assuming you mean hunters and bookmakers. Are those they must be bulletproof, mustn't they? Uh I think stuff always changes. So you always need somebody having a keeping an eye on things. Um with regard to Paddy Power, they'd have a lot smarter people than me on a computer building models. I was always inputting from a trader point of view. And that's kind of where my skill is basically. If you want me to build a model, I think you're gonna struggle. I can advise on the things that your model's missing when it's spitting out outputs and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I kind of don't really do it for bookmakers anymore, to be honest with you. It's kind of something that I did do, and it's something I did very briefly when I left Paddy Power uh, for somebody. Um, but I kind of be doing it all myself now just because I have more time and uh, and I can get more out of it, getting accurate prices myself and then just betting with them, basically. So, uh, yeah. My second from last question was going to be, is your way of doing things something that will always be viable but I, or do you have to be one step ahead? And I think we've already ascertained from what you said in this that you are always looking to, to do the next thing. I mean, have yeah. you got your eye on the next thing already for when the thing that you're doing now goes tits up? <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping it doesn't go tits up, but I hope I get out before it goes tits up. But um, yeah, you just always, I think stuff always evolves basically is what I'd say. So I think you want to be just always on top of things and always trying to see where things are going. And some things, if they do go downhill, you want to be exiting. And you're, yeah, I'm always looking for the next thing, basically. Uh, yeah, just um, yeah, just stuff evolves and you've just got to be on top of things and you're just always trying to see which way the wind's blowing and be at the head of the queue for, for, that, for the next thing, basically. So um, yeah, just, just trying to evolve as much as I can. Now, the, the final question, I've got to ask you if it's true or not first, was, is it, is my information correct that one of your ambitions was always to win a million quid for one bet? Yeah, it would have been, yeah. Like, I used to love, I know some people don't like him. Um, I know Matthew Trenhale usually winds me up about it, but, like, I, I when I read Patrick Veach's book, it was kind of a big thing for me because I'd heard about Veach from the past, from people who used to work in trading rooms and what Veach was up to and stuff, and I just... I was just fascinated by it, basically. And I know a lot of people might not like him or they don't like what he did. Or I, I, he was just a bit of, he was probably a little, Harry Finley used to be always a little bit of a cult hero of mine as well. Harry Finley and Patrick Beach and the two different, two different ways of going about things and definitely two different approaches. I used to like Finley because he was just a character. There's no characters around. Um, and he was obviously throwing massive money around and that was kind of intoxicating as well with with like half a punter streak and half smart as well it was always interesting to see which way it was going to go uh, and uh, but like Patrick Veach I kind of I kind of I kind of related a bit more to the just the ice cold dispassionate person just getting money out of it and then fucking off in his helicopter somewhere kind of like when I had no money and I was getting the bus everywhere it was kind of something that I aspired to to do um, and I think he was talking uh, he might have talked about winning a million quid or something like that so when you've got no money you have these you put numbers on things but like uh, yeah I don't I don't set myself amounts to win and stuff like that anymore anyway okay well I think both of those guys I've spoken to both of them they've yet to do one of these but I have spoken to yeah. them both so hopefully if you're watching yeah get Patrick Beach yep. if you get a hold of Patrick Harry. Beach pass him, pass him my number as well I'd love to have a chat with him and the final, the final. So, have you actually done it? Have you achieved? Have you achieved your ambition there yet? To what? Win a million quid. Won a million quid on one bet yet? 
uh, yeah, but it wasn't all mine. <laughs> I had, I had stake, I had stakeholders. So I had, I had people taking shares. So, uh, no, it wasn't all mine, but yeah, we did it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great to hit end on a, on a successful note. So, um, anyway, Anthony, thank you very much for uh, talking to us. It's been brilliant. Really appreciate it. Nice one, man. It was a pleasure as well. And love the series. And uh, yeah, it's just a pleasure to, to chat to you. I feel like I know you. So it's been good. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cheers.